Unprepared isn't scripted or edited. There are no redos, and when we screw up, it's going live. This works for our show, but it is no way to run your e-commerce business. Our partner, Rewind, is here to help. They will help you back up your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install on your store to protect it from human error, misbehaving apps, or collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. It's trusted by over 70,000 retailers from side hustles to the biggest online stores like Gymshark, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. Best of all, if you reply to any of their welcome series and mention Unprepared, you can get your first month free. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Unprepared. Today, I am welcoming to the show Zach Toste from Dotcom Partners. Zach is about to school me. And I mean literally school me on uh, feeds, how feeds work, uh, emerging marketplaces. And all this might sound like gibberish to you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Zach. And Zach's going to kind of talk us through what dot-com partners have been up to recently and where they're focusing the future of their business and the future of all their clients' businesses. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so basically, to give everybody who's listening a little bit of a background on dot-com partners. So We were uh, founded back in December of 2019, um, and my co-founder, Corey Hammond, and I basically were kind of like ruminating on this idea uh, while we were at walmart.com of, you know, what if there was a way where we could kind of make e-commerce an easier channel to navigate for brands that might not be that top cream of the crop uh, echelon of, of brands within a category. And one thing led to another, and we finally decided to pull the trigger um, you know, and, and we really got off to a good start, uh, with our client base. Uh, we started off with a team of three of us who we all used to work together on the same team at walmart.com. Um, and over time, you know, obviously as COVID hit, uh, it ended up being something that was really good for our business because as everyone probably knows, you know, the e-commerce world got shifted upside down and everyone started shopping online. Um, so it, we pretty much went from overnight of figuring out like, how are we going to get more clients? And then the script got really shifted to how are we going to handle the clients that we have with only this amount of people? Um, and fast forward to today, you know, we have uh, 13 employees. We've got over 30 clients. Um, we've served brands of all different shapes and sizes from, you know, direct to consumer startups all the way up to like Walmart private labels that we've worked with uh, in tandem with store buyers to help them round out their online assortment. Um, but in a nutshell, you know, uh, what Dotcom Partners does is we take a look at your online business. We are all expert merchandisers. Most of our team comes from a walmart.com. So we've just used the relationships that we've had and that we've kind of gathered throughout the years working there and really tried to bring that top tier talent over into Dotcom Partners. And we, our main message is just to have our clients diversify their online sales channels. Um, and basically what that means is a lot of the times, you know, we'll get clients who only operate in Amazon or only operate in one specific retailer and they want to expand. Um, and currently, you know, where we're, we're best at is uh, walmart.com because that's our bread and butter and what we know. Uh, but as we look forward to the future and what we're starting to explore now is how do we get clients onto Walmart Canada? How do we get them onto Target? How do we get them into Kroger? And how do we help them thrive in those marketplaces? Um, because if you think from an investment perspective, you know, where a lot of these marketplaces are at now is where Walmart was three or four years ago, as far as like how much time and resources and, you know, just overall development has been going on within those platforms. So we figure if we're first to the game and, and again, not only in Walmart, but to all of these emerging retail channels, you know, we can really help brands succeed and diverse uh, beyond just the one or two places they might be selling right now. Oh yeah, and so I, I guess a lot of the listeners here are—I uh, don't know. You know what? I should survey my audience again. But from what I remember last time, is it's definitely a lot of uh, direct consumer brands. A lot of them are using Shopify. That's you know that's that's what I'm really good at. So, but anytime we start talking about using these other marketplaces, it's you know my opinion has shifted over the years. Um, but it, it's definitely yeah, you should be there. Uh, and you should figure out how it works for your business. Obviously, the the big the big player in the space is Amazon. Um, but what kind of uh, you know when someone's talking to you and they're in in these initial phases of conversation about like I should be you know why should I be on a Walmart dot com you know why should I be on Target dot com I sell my branded widget through my own dot com like what is that going to do for me? Yeah, I mean I think that 
it's really just all about like knowing like who your core audience is and how they're going to be finding your product. Um, nowadays, obviously, I think any brand who values first party data is going to want to prefer a D2C strategy, you know, whether that's on Shopify or WordPress or whatever. Um, but, you know, I don't think any of them are exclusionary, right? If you're doing one, you should probably be doing a couple um, just because you could almost look at these extra channels as almost like an extra boost to your to your brand awareness um, and reaching people that you otherwise wouldn't reach with social media targeting or email campaigns or what have you. So there's always uh, there's always a benefit to expanding your horizons. Um, you know, some of our clients that we work with, uh, they operate in both of our silos within dot com partners because we do have let's call it like a retail team and a direct consumer team. So one part of our business does really focus a lot on building out Shopify stores and helping clients with more of the traditional digital marketing asks. But what, when we've seen the most success is when you can blend the two strategies together and really figure out how to have the two, um, the two channels really working with each other rather than like having a online retailer strategy and having a direct to consumer strategy. Uh, there's really a way that you can mix the both and make it make them both play off of each other really well. Absolutely. And obviously use, using these other marketplaces are going to... In short, if you have a product that is selling on your own website, you've got product market fit. When you, when you take a product with that level of maturity to a marketplace, it's going to sell. I mean, that's it's just that simple of a statement. Um, what, what kind of... Uh, Results have you seen as far as like velocity or like scale for these clients? Does it help them scale? Does it help them hit those kind of economies of scale where they're going to have uh, an easier time with you know doing larger purchase orders or funding? Uh, you know what what are some of the other you know ancillary benefits of like just selling more of your product faster? Yeah, I mean um, definitely like you you hit the nail on the head, especially with economies of scale. You know, again, direct consumers sometimes depending on what your product and industry is. It can be a, uh, a slow moving process or relatively so, right? Um, but again, if you're operating on multiple sales channels and you're really kind of pulling those different levers, um, not only are you going to be able to scale more quickly and again, reach uh, a bigger audience just that much more exponentially, but at the same time, um, you know, I think any brand's kind of pie in the sky is how do I get like in store uh, in a retailer? And again, it has to be the right product market fit. But you're starting to look at these D2C brands over time, starting to develop relationships. Uh, you look at Quip and Target. Uh, you look at all these other D2C brands that are really starting to pop up in uh, these big box retailer stores, which in a way kind of goes against the original D2C model, right? Of just like you're selling direct to consumer, we're cutting out the middleman. There's no more uh, retail cost. But uh, as you scale as a brand, what being from the Walmart side and knowing that ecosystem and how that has worked, Basically, it would be like you create this brand presence, you create a following, and you have this brand recognition. And as you start scaling and offering a wider product assortment, maybe you know if you're going into a Walmart or a Target store, you offer um, a more cost-effective product that would resonate with that Target or Walmart customer rather than having to like match up perfectly with uh, what you're selling on your D2C site. Um, another thing that I've noticed too, and this is more so of brands that have scaled uh, tremendously already. So if you look like uh, at like Frito Lay's, what they've done in the past year of launching their own D 2 C stuff, and you're starting to see all these big CPG companies launching direct to consumer experiences, um, that's kind of like what we're seeing in the reverse, where it's like they've only traditionally been in you know brick and mortar, big box retailer stores. How do you connect with customers beyond that? Um, and furthermore, you know, being able to offer limited products or like let's call it like your long tail assortment. Um, on your D 2 C channels and then using those in-store ones as like, you know, if I'm a, a potato chip manufacturer, you know, you're going to have your sour cream and onion, salt and vinegar and barbecue chips on the, on the shelves. Cause you know, that's what sells, but maybe on D 2 C, you also offer your limited time, like Tabasco sauce or your, you know, weird funky flavors that are kind of almost a novelty. So it's again, really understanding, like you need to really just understand your market, understand your product and where people are going to be shopping for what. Absolutely. And then I, I know that uh, people would yell at me in the comments if I didn't ask, um, you know, one of the things, uh, things, one of the arguments, I guess, or just kind of like, uh, it, it is what it is. People bring up all the time when talking about Amazon is, you know, there's the fee, there's the fee. Uh, so kind of what does what does that look like for, uh, you know, using the Walmart feed, I guess, and then 
Um, you know, if you have any other information you can share about any of the other feeds that you guys have been exploring as of late. Yeah. So just to clarify, you're, you're mentioning like when you, when you sell, you're just getting, you have to give Amazon like a commission, um, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think pretty much across the board, any marketplace that you're selling in, uh, you're going to have some sort of fee attached, but then my kind of argument to that would be like, what's your cost per acquisition when you're monetizing through social, you know, you're not, you're not getting those customers for free unless you have some incredible marketing playbook that I don't know about. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, again, all about, and that's where I think a lot of the, um, this is where the line gets really blurred between, you know, being like a marketer and being able to acquire customers, but then where Dotcom Partners really adds that value is that we're, we're truly merchandisers first and marketers second. So, you know, being able to analyze like your product costs, looking at, you know, your cost per acquisition averages across D to C, and you equate that to, well, okay, if, if your average cost per acquisition is 25% of your margin, can you sustain that when you move over into a walmart.com or to a Kroger's or to a Target uh, online? And, you know, is that equitable? Like, are you, you should theoretically be willing to pay that amount to acquire a customer. Um, you know, again, it's all about just like really recognizing like, where you want to be playing in this audience uh, and where you kind of like want your product to be falling within the, uh, the spectrum of online. Awesome. And now that kind of leads me to my next question, which is like, can anybody be in these marketplaces? You know, can they get into these product feeds or, you know, is it invite only? Do I need to have a certain sort of volume, so certain sort of brand awareness? You know, can any, anybody listening to this podcast get their products in say Walmart's feed? Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that over the last year, like, especially again, since COVID, uh, went down, Walmart has started relying a lot more on their marketplace offering and really gone away from, uh, one P which would be either dropship or owned inventory. Um, so mostly, yes, I would say like, if you have a compelling enough product and you, you know, do some research, like literally just start searching, uh, keyword terms for your product on walmart.com, let's say. And if you think that your product falls in there and you are adding a gap in Walmart's online assortment, or you are better priced, or you can add some sort of value to, you know, what you think that their customers are shopping currently, you've already got a very strong case. Um, I will say for other marketplaces, it's a little bit more ambiguous, again, since some of them are a little bit more behind uh, from where Walmart is. Some of them are invite only. Some of them have to kind of have a proven sales track record. So I would say, you know, it, it really just depends. Um, it's worth exploring uh, and worth kind of like just it really, I hate to say it, but it is like a case by case basis, um, you know, because, for example, if you're a really niche brand and you're trying to get into like a Lowe's, but maybe like your assortment doesn't necessarily fit like what Lowe's.com is going for, you might have a tougher time getting listed rather than going to a Walmart.com. No, no, that makes complete sense. Uh, so if if someone is listening to this and they're like, you know what, like, I, I really think that my product would probably do well uh, on, on walmart.com. How do they get a hold of you? How do they reach out? Yeah. Um, so you can just go to uh, .com partners .com. Um, You know, we have plenty of contact forms on there to, uh, to fill out. Uh, you can also send over an email to business at .com partners .com. Um, But basically, you know, what we do is, uh, you know, we have these onboarding surveys that'll basically just gauge like, where are you selling right now? What channels are you operating in? Um, what do you need help with? Uh, and from there, you know, one of our team members will, you know, take the reins and kind of like guide you through our process. Um, I will say over time, we've had to get a little bit more selective with our clients that we're taking on just because bandwidth is a thing. And, you know, as much as I would love it, we can't just keep on hiring and hiring and hiring. So now we're starting to have to try to basically match make with our clients, um, which I think just allows us to provide the best service possible. Um, what we are doing, though, in the near future is uh, we're working on an educational platform um, that is going to be kind of for the people who don't necessarily um, meet that best fit for our clientele in the immediate term. Um, we are developing this online resource, uh, basically an app that uh, really just corrals all of our knowledge that we have uh, with Walmart.com. You know, we have a glossary of, I think, over 200 terms already of, you know, when you hear people talking about Walmart.com or maybe even e-commerce in general, you know, what, is, what do these acronyms mean? What do these terms mean? How does it fit into like my overall strategy online? Um, and, you know, we're really trying to see if there's an appetite in the market of, well, if you're running a lean D2C startup and you have a team of four or five and don't have a budget to hire an agency, 
can you invest, you know, whatever the cost is for this new educational platform and empower your own team uh, to figure out how to operate on these channels or at least get up and running uh, by themselves. And as part of that offering, you know, we're also trying to work in, uh, let's say, you know, you, you go through and you're in the item setup uh, portion of our, of our course and you're a little bit stuck and a little bit confused. Um, we're trying to come up with like different packages of like, oh, okay, well, you can hire a DCP for two hours and we can get one of our specialists to come and help you walk you through the item setup phase or get you onboarded onto walmart.com. So we're really trying to see how we can help as many people as possible while keeping it cost effective for um, our potential clients as well. Absolutely, Zach. I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. Everybody, I'll link to uh, you know all that all of the information that Zach has shared into the show notes as well. And I'm sure you'll be back soon enough. And you know, as as these marketplaces evolve, you're going to be my go-to guy when I have questions. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Chase. I appreciate it.